Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, the numbers are still going up, but we have um, a lot of people joining us here tonight. I thought this would be a very exciting seminar for everybody. So I'm Helen McNaughton. I'm chair of the Japan Research Centre um, here at SOAS. And um, it's a real pleasure to welcome tonight Rachel Hutchinson, who is originally from England and got her doctorate from the University of Oxford, uh, but is now based in Delaware, University of Delaware in the US, and where she teaches Japanese language and literature and culture there. And she's published widely on, on identity and representation in Japanese narrative texts. So everything from novels to manga, to films, and now video games. And so tonight she's going to uh, talk about her latest book, which I have a copy of the cover here to show you um, in case you're interested in buying it. That's what it looks like if you were to buy it. So it's um, obviously Japanese culture through video games. Um, and so she's gonna be talking about how Japanese games are obviously um, popular entertainment, uh, but they also tackle bigger social issues as well. And I have to put my hand up and confess that I know absolutely nothing about video games. I've never played one. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to being a student tonight and learning about, learning about video games and how they express Japanese culture. So just a tiny little bit of housekeeping. Um, so just to set the schedule, uh, Rachel is going to talk to us for about uh, 45 minutes or so, and then we should have plenty of time for Q&A, and you'll notice um, that there's a Q&A uh, function there, so you can type any questions uh, that you have into the Q&A chat function. Um, not, so, not the chat, just the Q&A if you don't mind. Um, uh, so use that to type in questions and I will, I will moderate those and um, Rachel is very happy to answer them at the end of her talk. Um, so if you want to go ahead and, and share your screen, Rachel, yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, turn off my camera while you talk so everybody can concentrate on looking at you and your slides. So over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Helen, for the introduction. I'm um, very honoured to be here at SOAS today for this lecture. And I'd really like to thank Professor McNaughton for inviting me. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I'm Australian, um, but I did spend uh, quite a bit of time in England and um, I'm really happy to be uh, giving this lecture for SOAS today. So here are some things, whoops, I have to do my cursor, there we are. Here are some things that you might find in a course on Japanese culture. Uh, we have Natsume Soseki's novel, Kokoro, Kurosawa Akira's film, Rashomon, Miyazaki Hayao's animated film, Ponyo, Tezuka Osamu's manga, Astro Boy, an ukiyo-e woodblock print and a ceramic teacup. So all of these artistic works can be understood as kinds of texts, but what do we learn from them? We learn aesthetic values, what Japanese people think is beautiful or good or useful. We learn about important places, times in history, and anxieties felt by the people, the role of the individual in society, the value of truth, how to grow up and assert yourself as a free agent, and what makes us human. Just as Kokoro captured the anxiety of the Meiji period in 1914, I would argue that Final Fantasy VII does the same thing for the year 1997. There are a couple of points I want to make in this talk. And one is about the positioning of the medium in how we think about it. The novel used to be seen as really low class, popular entertainment, right? Natsume Soseki um, serialized this novel, Kokoro, in the Asahi newspaper. His books really captured the essence of the times. And in the same way, I think that the big classics of the Japanese role-playing game genre, or the JRPG, are popular entertainment narratives that take on big issues like social anxiety, absentee parents, nuclear power, and war memory. Both the novel and the video game can give us great insight into the context of Japanese culture. There are a few ways in which we can use video games as texts to learn about Japanese culture. One is through character design, 
Another is the background setting and the environment of the game world. We can look at the aesthetic style of the game, uh, the thematic content, and the game dynamics and goals, what the player has to do in the game. And so today I want to look at each of these in turn. Let's start with character design. A lot of Japanese games, particularly the big popular role-playing games, feature main characters that look like this. They have big hair, they're spiky, often blonde, blue eyes, a slim build, yet muscular physique, big swords, and interesting clothing design. This is Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy VII. On the left, you'll see him in concept art. And on the right, this is how he appeared in the game, in the original 3D polygon rendering. Remember, this is 1997. <laughs> okay. Similarly, we have uh, Titus from Final Fantasy X. That's the 10th game in the series from 2001. This is Noctus from Final Fantasy 15, released in 2016. And this is Sora from Kingdom Hearts in 2002. These characters look similar because they were all designed by the same person, Nomura Tetsuya, at the company Square, now Square Enix. All of these characters draw on the same conventions of character design that we find in Japanese culture, like anime, manga, etc. This is the shōnen, the youth, the young man, on the verge of becoming an adult, but still young enough to jump around, play, and get into trouble. The visual design, as I mentioned, comes mostly from manga and anime. The spiky hair shows the character's dynamism, how genki he is, his get up and go. And this admirable quality in the young Japanese male has been pretty much constant in character design since the Meiji period, ever since Samuel Smiles' book, Self Help, extolled the values of Rishin Shuse standing up on your own two feet, getting out into the world, making something of yourself and contributing to society. The tension in the JRPG and a lot of Japanese cultural products is that this sounds like a lot of work. These young heroes are stuck between the child they wish they still were and the adult they are becoming. So the youthful exuberance on one hand is usually balanced by some deep psychological problems as the hero has to adjust to their place in the world and define their identity. In the case of Cloud and Titus, uh, this is a real mission and a big part of gameplay. Um, they have both lost their memories at the start of the game, they're afflicted with amnesia and they don't know who they are or what their mission is. It's your job as the player to help them find out. Moving over to the, um, the fighting game genre. This is the cast of Soul Calibur 2. This is a game from uh, Namco in 2002. And character design in this genre is extremely important to quickly establish which country the character comes from and what kind of fighting style they have. Each character, as you'll probably notice here, is incredibly stereotyped. So you have the Kung Fu master, the nunchuck fighter, the short sword Greek goddess, the ninja warrior, the samurai, and so on. Uh, so for a minute here, I want to look at uh, Mitsurugi Heishiro. You can see him uh, just to the right of center there. And this is what he looks like in Soul Edge on the left and the Soul Calibur series there. These are from Namco Bandai through the 1990s and still continuing today. Mitsurugi is the archetypal samurai warrior. Now I use these games uh, in class to teach about representations of race, gender and sexuality in games. Mitsurugi embodies the Japanese self. He is privileged over and above the other characters in the series. Um, which is interesting because in fighting games, all the characters are supposed to be equally balanced in terms of their uh, fighting skill and, and so forth. But Mitsurugi is the player one default in Soul Edge. As the player, you have to physically move the joystick away from Mitsurugi in order to play as any other character. He is uh, one of the main characters that's featured in Attract Mode in the, the cabinet games for Soul Edge and the Soul Calibur series. 
And attract mode is a cinematic loop that plays in the arcade while nobody's playing the game. It's, it's flashy, it's loud, it's interesting, there's a lot of music. And Mitsurugi is usually there on the screen enticing you to come and play the game. Uh, he's featured on the cabinet art, the cover art of the games, and um, features heavily in the opening cinematics. So before you insert the coin and after you insert the coin while the loading screen um, plays and, and what have you. Now over time, you'll see that Mitsurugi's, uh, visually speaking, Mitsurugi's basic elements are pretty much consistent. Uh, he's usually wearing tubby socks and he has a katana, he has a messy hairdo, uh, <laughs> looks like a ronin, okay. But you'll notice over time the iconography gets more specifically Japanese and more nationalistic over time. He starts off in this kind of vaguely oriental costume and then over time there's more red incorporated into the palette. You get this big uh, nawa rope around the middle, um, Japanese armour, uh, there, there's dragons on his costume here on, on the left. Um, but then the dragons give way to uh, chrysanthemums and Buddhist imagery on the right there. Uh, that's him in Soul Calibur V. So over time, he kind of becomes more Japanese, I would argue. What's interesting about the privileging of Mitsurugi in the narrative is that he's also privileged in the user interface. This is the character select screen. It happens to be showing Ivy right now. You can choose any of these characters to play as, right? But you'll see Mitsurugi is in the upper top left corner. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm indicating you with my cursor right now. Um, now, this doesn't change over the course of the series, even though the default player one character does change over time. Uh, sometimes you, you start off as Talon and what have you, but he's always up there in the upper left hand corner. So he's privileged uh, visually. And this uh, kind of privileging of the main Japanese male character in the game can also be seen in, in Virtua Fighter with Akira Yuki in Tekken with uh, Kazuya Mishima and later Jin Kazama, and also in Street Fighter with Ryu. And this is uh, Ryu here in Street Fighter 2. You'll see that he is the default player one character. This is how it opens up. You have to physically move the joystick away from Ryu if you want to play as anyone else. And the default player two character is Ken. Okay, and Liu is uh, privileged in the narrative as he travels from uh, country to country in a little plane and he gets out of different countries to do uh, different um, fights with various masters. Um, but he's also very, very prominent in art, cover art for the game. That's the Capcom uh, poster there. And on the right, you'll also see him on the side of the cabinet. Um, and what's on the side of the game cabinet is actually really important because that is what you see from the street. Like if you're out on the street and you're looking into the arcade, those end uh, cabinets will have their sides facing out into the street a lot of the time. And so you'll see that uh, cover art right away. And so the same thing happens with Akira Yuki in Virtual Fighter 2. This cabinet's really interesting because he's on the left side and the right side of the cabinet. <laughs> uh, which is really rare. Usually you've got two different characters uh, on each side of the cabinet. Uh, Akira Yuki is prominent in, uh, here's a, a, a flyer for Sega uh, selling Virtua Fighter to, um, to the, the arcade uh, proprietors and so on. But I, over on the right there, that's the cover art uh, for Virtua Fighter on the Sega Saturn. And Akira Yuki is right in the front. You can see him there with the, the spiky hair. Um, and it's the same for uh, Kazuya Mishima in Tekken. Over there on the left, you'll see the original Tekken on the PlayStation 1 with um, Kazuya Mishima looking very tall and muscular in the middle of everybody else. And as the series goes along, he's um, supplanted by his son, uh, Jin Kazama, who, who takes the front stage there uh, in Tekken 5. So over and over again, 
in the fighting game genre, we get the normative Japanese male being placed in this central position, the player one default position. And so we can use these games to understand what's valued in relation to masculinity in Japanese society, for example. Okay, we can also learn about Japanese culture from how the set designs are put together. And here's the associated stage set for Mitsurugi, for example. Uh, this is the Sakura Dai Gate at Kaminoi Castle in the game narrative. And this kind of iconography comes straight from traditional Japanese architecture and garden aesthetics, with the cherry blossom symbolizing the ephemeral nature of life, especially for the young samurai or soldier cut down in their prime. Cherry blossoms bloom fully and then float away on the wind, which is very beautiful and fleeting. They don't hang around or wither on the tree. Uh, so the message is to live life to the full while you have it. And you can see this in Japanese Buddhism in the aesthetics of ukiyo-e, the floating world art as well. So when we talk about Japanese environments in games, it's often this kind of image that comes to mind. Another kind of image is the beautiful nature environment which is often seen in the JRPG. Here again, we have Cloud from Final Fantasy VII running into a beautiful forest environment. This game was really interesting for the 2D painted uh, artwork that forms the background. And then on top of that, you had the 3D figures moving through space. And what I wanna point out here is a similarity between this kind of background and that found in Miyazaki Hayao's films. So this is a scene from Princess Mononoke in 1997, made the same year as Final Fantasy VII. Let's have a look at another one. Is this an anime or a video game? It's actually a scene from another JRPG, Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch, that came out from Namco Bandai in 2011. This is kind of a trick question because the game was developed in collaboration with Studio Ghibli. So yes, the animation is supposed to look like a Miyazaki film here. But we can learn a lot about what Japanese people value in their environment from the way they depict it in art. So you have the lush greens, the clear air, bubbling waters and huge old growth trees dominating the landscape. This shows a reverence for nature and perhaps a feeling of loss now that we live in a very built up environment. Some of these games have been analysed in terms of Shinto practice, and you can see this in the latest uh, big game from Nintendo. This is The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, released on the Switch console in 2017. Certain features that stand out in the environment, like a particularly large rock, tree or mountain, have their own little spirits inside them called Koroks, and here's one. Uh, they're friendly, they pop out and say hello, and they help you by giving you seeds, which you can then trade in for inventory upgrades. Uh, so the message here is paying attention to nature helps you. Uh, the forest people also give you weapons that are made out of wood. Uh, which are impervious to electricity. And this becomes really important because in this game, a lightning strike can actually kill you. Uh, so if you look at the concept art books for this game, in the margins, they've got uh, Studio, uh, Studio Ghibli uh, written in katakana. Uh, so this was not an official collaboration like Nino Kuni, uh, but the designers wanted to evoke the same kind of respect for the environment uh, that you find in, in those films. Now thinking about Japanese environments, <laughs> other scholars have also noted that Japanese games set the standard for how to render 3D environments with an interior setting. So games like Resident Evil in 1996, which we see here, established a certain kind of Japanese look for video games. Survival horror games depend on closed in rooms and a dark palette to produce a feeling of claustrophobia in the player. Konami's Fox Engine produces a similar kind of dread in the player. So you feel the need to sneak around and move quietly in this environment. This is Metal Gear Solid, directed by Kojima Hideo. This kind of 3D space is now very familiar to anyone who plays games built using Konami's Fox Engine. But the player may not realize that the game environment has Japanese roots. 
Another way to learn about Japan from game environments is through super realistic renderings of the real world. On the left here, we have a scene from Persona 5 uh, made by Atlas in 2016. This is based very closely on the real life streets of Shibuya and other suburbs of Tokyo. This shot of the real life equivalent uh, to the game scene on the right was posted on Twitter by a fan. There are lots of threads on uh, forums and discussion boards where people have hunted down the real environment and posted a picture uh, together with a screenshot of the game. So in this kind of game, exploring the game environment is more like taking a virtual tour of the real life Japanese city. So we've seen in our character designs and backgrounds how Japanese video games draw on manga and anime conventions to create a certain kind of look, which players associate with Japan and Japanese culture. This is achieved in a different way by rendering uh, uh, interior environments in 3D, uh, which produces a certain kind of affect or emotional response in the player. Over time, the early graphics and hand-drawn designs have given way to more photorealistic graphics. So we feel more and more as if we're moving through the real world of the game space. Lastly, just like any other art medium, film, oil paintings, watercolors, sculpture, animation, or whatever, there will always be people who want to express their ideas in a more experimental and unique way. A good example I can think of here that expresses Japanese art style and a strong focus on Japanese culture is Okami. Uh, this is a game developed by Clover Studio in 2006. Okami has a unique art style which is based on hand-drawn characters, environments and animated sequences. It draws on traditional ink styles and incorporates calligraphy uh, even into the gameplay, you as the player do calligraphy in order to achieve certain things in the game. And it also includes a lot of religious iconography. The title is a pun. All coming can mean wolf or god. And you play as this white wolf here. And this is the incarnation of the sun goddess, Amaterasu Omikami. Okami uses a lot of the same symbolism as other games from Japan, with cherry trees and so forth, but here they're more directly linked to Shinto, as you see with the big Tori gate on the right there. And also you'll notice there's a white uh, Shimenawa rope around the cherry tree itself, indicating that it's a sacred tree. In the background, I'll see if I can move my cursor over here, there's a dead tree here, right? Um, and part of gameplay in Orkami is to go around the environment, find dead trees like this, and use your calligraphy brush uh, to make them bloom. You bring them back to life. And so um, this gameplay itself carries out the mission of feeling reverence for nature. The environment and background in Orkami uses a lot of traditional architecture. And if you go in this building here, which you can do, uh, you'll also find traditional Japanese furniture, uh, zabuton cushions, musical instruments, teapots, and so on. You can often go up to items and examine them by pushing on a button. And a text box will appear with an explanation saying something like, Samisen, three stringed instrument used for dramatic stage performances. So you can learn a lot about Japan just by moving through the space and interacting with the environment. Uh, interestingly, looking at the building here, you can tell this is not an accurate, historically specific uh, depiction. Um, it's more of a mishmash uh, to give an idea of ancient Japan, this kind of idealistic feeling of what ancient Japan uh, was like. A lot of the story is inspired by the Kojiki, the record of ancient matters published in the 8th century, which recounted the tales of gods and legendary heroes. So here on the left, we have the character Susano. Uh, according to legend, the brother of Amaterasu and a fierce warrior who also gets drunk a lot in the Kojiki. Uh, in the game also, he's always after sake, which is brewed by the young woman Kushi. And you can see her here on the right in her rice field. 
One of the first missions in this game is to fix the water wheel for Cushy uh, so she can power her machinery to pound the rice to make sake. So there are many ways in which the aesthetic style of a game can be used to complement its ideology and content. Here I'd like to suggest that the JRPG, the Japanese role-playing game, can be regarded as the shishosetsu for our era. This is the eye novel that dominated 20th century literature in Japan. As narrative forms, both the JRPG and the shishosetsu are extremely long. Uh, the JRPG can take anywhere from 50 to 100 hours to complete. Okami took me 130 hours and that's uh, saved game time. So that doesn't include all the times that you fail and you have to redo the whole mission and it's, it's saved game time, successful game time. Uh, that took me 130 hours. Um, both these things, the JRPG and the Shisho Setsu are very much concerned with the place of the individual self in society. And both explore uh, pressing issues of the day. And I think that you can see this especially in JRPGs of the 1990s, which explore a lot of uh, quite difficult issues, uh, such as nuclear power, war memory, bioethics and social breakdown. And these um, roughly correlate to uh, chapters in, in my book, uh, Japanese Culture Through Video Games. Um, today, what I thought I might do is take bioethics as a case study uh, to show how the game text works within its context. So if we do that with bioethics, um, these are some good games in which uh, bioengineering and genetic manipulation form a good part of the main story. I think the theme comes across most fully in the longer game structures of the role-playing uh, genre and action, adventure games, but you can also see it in fighting games and also survival horror. We'll start off with Final Fantasy VI from Square in 1994. And this game is full of genetic experiments which are integral to the main plot. The villain Kefka over here on the left, uh, gloating about being all powerful, um, he spends most of his time hunting magical creatures called espers. And he uses them uh, to extract magical power. And up here on the right, we can see uh, four espers trapped in big glass jars. This is inside Kefka's Magitech research facility. The clearest one you can see here is uh, this kind of unicorn type creature. Um, what, what Kefka is doing is extracting magic out of these living beings and then turning that magic into weapons um, through the invention of Magitech armor. This is a wearable suit that emits a very powerful blast of light energy from the chest. And in this way, uh, the ruler, the Emperor Gestal, uh, was able to create an invincible army of Magitech soldiers. At the center of all this is the character Terra, who is half human and half Esper. Uh, kidnapped as a child, Terra is raised as an elite Magitech soldier. Kefka forces her to wear a slave crown to subdue her thoughts and sends her out into battle wearing the Magitek armor. On the right here, we see Amano Yoshitaka's beautiful art renderings of, of Terra wearing Magitek armor. Uh, she's shown riding on the back of a giant mechanical creature, almost like a dragon. And on the left there, the logo for Final Fantasy VI is in fact Terra riding on a Magitek. Uh, conveyance such as this. In this artwork, uh, the Magitek armor looks more alive than mechanical, and I think this highlights the biological nature of the weapon based on the sacrifice of all those espers in the glass jars. Moving on, in Final Fantasy VII, made by Square in 1997, this deals with similar themes of bioengineering. Here on the left, we see the main character Cloud Strife, uh, 
on the floor with his friend Zach, who's helping him up after they've escaped from these glowing glass tanks in the basement of the Shinra mansion. Like Kefka's Magitech factory, the Shinra mansion is a laboratory for growing super soldiers, infusing them with mako, which acts very much like nuclear material. This process gives soldiers a bright blue glow to the eyes, and Cloud didn't complete the process, but he does exhibit the same blue eyes, and he goes through the whole game completely confused as to whether or not he's a member of this elite fighting force. This also really confuses the player of the game. It leads to very high narrative tension and deep immersion in the game world, because you don't know what side you're on for most of the game. Also in this game, that evil scientist Hojo has also experimented on other people, such as Vincent Valentine, who's an optional character, but you can find him in the basement if you follow this hidden note, and we see Cloud reading the note there. Notice how this room and the, the one in the slide before, they look a lot like Resident Evil, Right, the designers of Final Fantasy VII use the same kind of uh, 3D rendering um, to get that very claustrophobic, scary feeling when you go into the Shinra Mansion. The Metal Gear Solid series by Konami is probably the most obvious narrative about bioethics in the history of video games. The story has more plot twists and turns than you can imagine, even if you've played the game. And it's hard to keep track of who's a clone of whom and how many different kinds of experiments have been run on how many people. Uh, the Metal Gear series has cloned super soldiers, people being turned into weapons, people with mechanical exoskeletons, people whose blood has been replaced with liquid plastic. You've got nanoviruses, uh, people being kept in suspended animation so their cells can be harvested and copied, a, a human surrogate mother, to a clone army. And all of this is generously paid for by the military industrial complex. One of the main genetic experiments in the series is this program known as Les Enfants Terribles. Uh, my French is terrible, sorry. Um, but children are grown from cells taken from the world's most powerful soldier, Big Boss. So this series, more than any other, explores the various aspects of bioengineering and the military from every possible angle. Bioethics is also a theme for fighting games. In the Tekken series, Jin Kazama carries the devil gene, inherited from his grandmother Kazumi via his father, Kazuya Mishima. In Japanese, this is called Devil's Blood, Debiru no Chi. Uh, the devil factor, debiru no inshi, or devil's power, debiru no chikara. It's never clearly explained what this devil gene is or where it originally came from. But the Mishima Zaibatsu and Jeep Corporation both want access to its power. The devil gene is manipulated by Jeep Corporation in cellular experiments, trying to create stronger human hybrids. Part of this mission is known as the GenoCell program. G Corporation has bioengineering facilities in Nepal and Nebraska, where various characters are taken through the game series to serve as subjects for genetic experimentation. The effect of the devil gene is clearly seen in depictions of Jin Kazama. Normally, he looks like a typical fighter found in games of this genre, with a fierce aspect to his face and a hypermuscular body. But when the devil gene switches on, get ready, his head spouts horns, large black wings appear on his back, and the irises of his eyes become yellow in colour. The change is directly reflected in the game dynamics, since Jin has different attacks in battle when the devil gene is activated. Lastly, I'd like to consider Resident Evil. Uh, this is one of the earliest survival horror games from Japan. The original title, Biohazardo, uh, Biohazard, indicates the biological concerns of the narrative. In this game, the Umbrella Corporation is a pharmaceutical company, but it's also a secret genetic engineering uh, enterprise. <laughs> 
we have more corporate bioengineering to create the ultimate bioweapon, uh, which in this game is called Tyrant. And of course, there's a huge disaster resulting in the release of biological mutagens known as the T-virus. This might sound familiar because of all the films. <laughs> Uh, when mutated cells arise in a living organism, this is called an infection. And this game is interesting because it looks at the infection of both humans and animals and how the pathogens pass between species. In the end, the only solution is atomic destruction and Raccoon City is obliterated. Taking these games as a set, we see many commonalities between them. All include corporate bioengineering, with government collusion. All feature the creation of a super soldier and or bioweapons. The dead are used for their cells and genetic material, thinking of Big Boss in Metal Gear Solid or Kazuya Mishima in Tekken. And scientific experiments are run on live subjects like Cloud and Terra against their will. The games also feature mad scientists. Uh, here you can see William Birkin, the scientist from Resident Evil 2, who is horrifically mutated by his own genetic experiments, uh, which is probably a very fitting end, actually. Um, other villains and scientists in these games are revealed to be horrifically mutated beings. Kefka and Hojo both mutate into several different forms in their final battles in Final Fantasy VII. This game dynamic was actually a feature of Final Fantasy and the Dragon Quest series uh, from very early on. Um, but here in these games, it serves a clear narrative purpose as well. We see a judgment and bias against the figure of the scientist and the narratives are generally uh, negative, set against the whole idea of bioengineering for military use. When you look at the release dates of the games I'm talking about here, you'll notice they all converge around the year 1996. This was the year that Dolly the Sheep was cloned, sparking a great deal of discussion over bioengineering and cloning worldwide. Some saw it as a culmination of research that had been intensifying through the 1990s, a miracle of human creation. Others saw it as unethical, as humans should not be tampering with the natural world. Dolly's health was followed obsessively in the media. And when she wasn't 100% healthy, many saw this to be proof that bioengineering was unethical and immoral. In Japan and other Asian countries, this anxiety was compounded by the Buddhist conviction that a person's body should remain whole and untampered with, both in life and after death. Organ donation in Japan is historically very low compared to Western countries. The cloning of embryos was banned in Japan in 2000, which was big news around the world at the time. Japan passed a number of laws in the early 2000s uh, surrounding uh, things like stem cell research, IVF and assisted reproduction, uh, cloning and so on. And all of this was connected to a much broader global bioethics debate. So all these games converge around the year 1996. Providing a discourse on bioethics in the mid 1990s in Japan. What I think is really interesting is if you look at the technology and hardware of video games at the time, this is also when the SNES or Super Nintendo was being pushed to its absolute limits and the new PlayStation console was being used to generate new kinds of graphics and action capabilities. So this brings us to the specifics of this discourse in the video game medium. How is this kind of discourse different to what we might find in literature or film? Ideology in games is put forward in a number of different ways. The most obvious way is through representation and narrative, what you see on the screen and what happens in the story. Now, these elements are common to literature, film, manga and anime. But games are also coded sets of rules that can be used by game designers to put forward their ideas, values, attitudes and beliefs in certain ways. As Gonzalo Frasca has argued, games have goal rules, what the player needs to do to win, and also manipulation rules, 
what the player can do and what the player can't do in the game. And these all together show the ideology of the game designer. So thinking about goal rules, in Final Fantasy VII, a Metal Gear Solid, the player and the character share the same goal, and that is to destroy nuclear weapons, okay? Uh, the problem is that when Cloud or Snake uh, try their best and it doesn't go according to plan, the player might experience complicity in nuclear accidents. So if Cloud goes and causes a massive nuclear accident, you, the player, feel guilty. You're complicit in this. And this feeling of guilt that you've actually done something terrible <laughs> to uh, other characters in the game, that motivates you uh, to fight against the nuclear enterprise. The other thing that's interesting here is that the success of Cloud Strife or Snake or any of the other characters in these games is almost completely dependent on the player choices and their skill. If you don't have the manual dexterity to actually um, defuse the bomb in time or whatever it is, then Snake's not going to be able to defuse it either because you're controlling Snake, right? So the, the game's success, the character's success is dependent on you. What this does is it draws very real connections between what's going on in the game world and your own actions in the real world. And I've argued that um, these connections are what make the, the nuclear critique very effective in these games. Uh, compared to things like literature and film, games have embodiment uh, that's lacking in other media, right? In a game, you are the main character. You're the one that's moving them around the screen. Through your actions, they succeed or fail. Um, so it's, it's working in a different way uh, to other media. If we look at Metal Gear Solid, um, and we're thinking about manipulation rules, uh, Snake's physicality in this series shows the bioethics discourse at work. Um, what I mean by that is that Snake as a character has um, this amazing ability to sneak around. Okay, these are tactical espionage games. So the snake can sneak around. Um, he has a great deal of strength and you, you kind of wonder about this through the game. Uh, but then of course, this comes through, this is a result of bioengineering. Okay, so it's not natural, this uh, sneaking ability that he has. Uh, later on in the series, uh, he turns into old snake. Okay, you see him with gray hair. He can't move as easily as he used to in the earlier games. He has a lot of physical limitations on his body. And uh, this is actually a problem with the cloning process. His body degrades over time. Okay. Now, what's interesting in Metal Gear Solid 5. Um, is that you have demon points and hero points that accrue uh, to the main character. And it acts as a kind of karmic system for the game. You can acquire hero points by doing positive things like liberating child soldiers, or uh, you can acquire demon points by doing negative things like, like building a nuclear weapon, for example. Uh, in fact, uh, building a nuclear weapon gives you so many demon points uh, that in many cases that the main character Snake will immediately uh, take on the aspect of a demon uh, with horns, bloodshot eyes and yellowish skin. It's, it's quite horrible. You, and you have to play as this character. Uh, so this tells you that making nukes is not a good thing. Okay, You feel revulsion uh, playing as, as this character. Uh, nuclear ideology is also put forward in the, the FOB, the Forward Operating Base, and this is a military installation you can develop as part of a minigame in, in Metal Gear Solid 5. So I want to look at this a, a little more. This screenshot shows a description of the nuclear weapon in the game. The most powerful weapon of mass destruction humanity has ever created. You get one trophy, uh, Deterrence, for creating a nuke, and a trophy called disarmament for getting rid of one. Now, there are some benefits to the player in developing a nuclear weapon. It deters other players from considering an attack on you. 
And the more nuclear weapons that a player owns, the less often their base can be invaded by other players. The player's ranking against other players is also dramatically increased. On the other hand, developing nuclear weapons is extremely expensive in terms of in-game currency, as well as fuel, resources, and stocks of metals. It takes the player a lot of time, effort, and hard-won resources to develop these weapons. Now, there's no capability in the game to actually use these weapons on other players. And uh, some disappointed players on the game forums were met with comments by longtime Metal Gear Solid fans. Uh, one of them said, this is Metal Gear Solid. They would never let anyone use a nuke in this game. It goes against the message they want to give us. Metal Gear Solid is and always will be an anti-nuke game. So there you have it. Um, players can also choose just not to develop a nuclear weapon in the first place. It's not needed. Uh, in the game. And some players on the discussion boards clearly see them as just not worth the trouble. Uh, to dispose of them, uh, the player must spend 100,000 GMP or in-game currency. Uh, you have to convert the weapon to nuclear waste and then send it off to be stored at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, the player is rewarded with a disarmament trophy and a thousand hero points, uh, but this does not make up for the 50,000 demon points uh, that, that you had for making the weapon in the first place. Um, the player can also infiltrate other players' bases and steal their nuclear weapons in order to stockpile or dispose of them, which makes it more interesting. The Famitsu official game guide explained that a special hidden ending could be triggered if all players on a specific server disarmed and disposed of their nuclear weapons. The disarmament event of 2015 caused a great deal of online discussion, spurred by press releases from Konami and tweets by Hideo Kojima himself. From November to December 2015, the total number of nuclear weapons owned by gamers across all consoles, that's the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 3, Xbox One, Xbox 360 and Steam, decreased by the thousands. And Konami was tracking the numbers on the official game website each day. Of course, this didn't last. Eventually the numbers started coming back up again and the effort to disarm is still ongoing. This is an actual uh, Reddit page called Metal Gear Anti-Nuclear with live nuke counts constantly updated across all servers. These people actively try to dismantle or steal other players' nukes in order to dispose of them. Uh, funnily enough, uh, last year, hackers set the number of nukes in the game to zero um, and they triggered the, the mysterious hidden cutscene. Um, but disarmament within the game itself has not yet been achieved. The game designer, Kojima Hideo, made the game this way to make people really think about what it means to possess nuclear weapons and also think about what disarmament really means and what it takes to achieve that. This is a great example of manipulation rules being used to make the player experience the ideology of the game for themselves. So I've just given you five ways in which we can learn about Japanese culture from games through character design, uh, environment, aesthetic choices and conventions, thematic content and gameplay dynamics. All these convey attitudes, ideas, values and messages from game designers, some conscious and some not. These are also related to the context in which the games were made. In this way, games and gameplay join a broader Japanese discourse. Game texts act in their context as an utterance in a broader parole. But if game texts are discursive objects, are game players engaged in discursive practice? This is the animated slide. <laughs> So games are part of a broader discourse, which I've been talking about. To think about it in terms of French post-structuralist thinking, we can see games as a text, as a statement, an utterance, a parole in the broader long. They fit into the broader discourse of the time. 
But the thing is, this is a different kind of utterance than we're used to when we're doing our literary criticism and things like this. And one reason for this is that the author in a game is very different to the author of a literary work. Uh, if you're looking at something like Soul Calibur, uh, that was developed by a small team called Project Soul within the much larger uh, game studio, Namco and Namco Bandai. If you're looking at Square Enix, uh, you have the, the main game designer and the script writer and so on, but then you have hundreds of people working on everything from character design to narrative to dialogue trees to item design, everything. And then you have localization on top of that. Uh, then you also have the executives who have to approve and then market the game, distribute it and what have you. So this idea of the author of a game, it's, it's closer to film than, than literature, but it's even bigger and more diffuse than that. The text in this sense, is, uh, in this uh, game medium is also co-authored by the player. And what I mean by that is the player is the one who's going through the game uh, making choices about various things. And in the JRPG, these choices might be quite limited and that all these choices might end up at the same place, right, in terms of the story. But in terms of the strategy and how you decide to play the game, you can level up one character more than others. You can decide that one of the characters is going to be a mage and equip them in all the items like sorcerer's habit and, and a, a magical staff and things like this. So you can kind of organize the items and inventory and equipment in certain ways so that your game will be quite different to the same game played by another player. Right, so the, the player themselves is engaged in authoring the text and also um, making their own meaning out of the game. And this meaning making is, is something that's uh, interesting in, in game studies right now. Another thing about uh, my work in, in video games is that the social critique in these texts, the social commentary on bioethics or nuclear anxiety or whatever else it might be, is really lived by the player through their experience of playing the game. If you're spending 100 hours or 130 hours uh, as Cloud Strife, then what he does in the game really affects you. Sometimes Cloud might do things that you don't want him to do. If you've been controlling him all the way through and then there's a cutscene, and he does something that's going against everything that you've been working for, that has a really deep impact on you. And so the, the designers, people like Kojima Hideo and the designers of, of Final Fantasy games, they're manipulating you as the player. And this is a way that you really feel the impact of the critique in ways that perhaps literature and film uh, don't achieve in the same way. Uh, it's a very active learning process in the, in the game text. And this is why I come to the idea that gameplay is discursive practice. If you're going through the game meaning making and uh, creating your own narrative, creating your own version of the text as you go along, um, then I've argued in, in my book, um, the gameplay itself can be seen as a kind of discursive practice. And uh, this is something that I'm interested in developing and then thinking about more in, in my future work. Oh, so here we come back to the syllabus, the game studies syllabus, the, sorry, the Japanese studies syllabus. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, what does this all mean for our syllabus on Japanese culture that we started with? Well, just as we read Kokoro for insight into Japanese masculinity or the role of the individual at the close of the Meiji period, uh, I've argued that we can look to Cloud Strife and Solid Snake as examples of the fractured individual at the close of the 20th century in Japan. Uh, so maybe now, when we think about using artistic works to understand Japanese culture, uh, we can include video games among those books and films and so on. And so here I've kind of made the, the books and films and the teacup move over a little bit to make room uh, for the video games. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that some of you here who already play games will look at them in maybe some new ways 
And I hope that those of you who don't play video games will recognize their value as artistic cultural objects with a lot to tell us about Japan and Japanese culture. Uh, personally speaking, I, I'd like to see more games included in Japanese studies uh, syllabi, uh, or at least included in the library as a learning resource for our students. Um, overall, I think that game studies and Japanese studies have a lot to learn from each other. And I see my work as trying to uh, bring those two fields closer together. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, that's the end of my part. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, that was um, fascinating, particularly, as I said, for somebody like me who has no idea about uh, video gaming or has played video gaming. So perhaps if I could start with a really obvious question, which leapt out at me, probably because of, of what I'm interested in personally. But um, can, can you tell us about the gender dynamics at play a little bit more here? So obviously, um, well, to me, all of the, the sort of characters that you introduced were male, uh, they were warriors, um, uh, and you, you, sh you showed us that many of the, the males are default players in, in the games, uh, but clearly there are some female characters there. So how, how, what are the sort of different rep representations of females that take place in, in gaming? Because I, did, I didn't get a sense of that from your talk, obviously, because of the, the way that you were concentrating, maybe because you were doing the fighting genre as well. So that warrior presence is, is very strong. So that was my sort of first question. And linked to that, um, the physicality of those, those male uh, warriors, uh, fighters, is pretty impressive. I mean, it's interesting that you linked it to bioethics because they do look quite genetically enhanced or ge <laughs> genetically engineered. Um, so I just wanted to ask about that a little bit more. Um, you know, they're fighters and they're heroes, but are there any male characters that are not quite so perfectly muscled? Are there one, you know, are there villains that are that look very different physically or portrayed very differently? So maybe you could comment on that as well <laughs> i'm sorry if those are very basic questions from someone no that's that's fantastic that's a nice place to start actually games. thank you for those um yeah so today i focused on the shonen and i've, I've done quite a bit of work on this representation the shonen and, and what he means in in japanese culture uh, but of course there are many many uh female characters in games um, in the jrpg uh in the very early games you, it was usually a male character Right. So I'm looking at things in the 1980s, 1990s. Things have moved on from that now. All right. And in the Final Fantasy series, there have been a, a couple of games, not many, uh, but there have been a couple of games where the main player character is a, a female character. Um, another thing that the Final Fantasy games do, which is quite interesting, is that not all of the games confine you to playing as that one player character all the way through the game. So, for example, right now I'm in the middle of Final Fantasy XII and the main character in mm. that story is Van and he looks exactly like those people that I showed you. All right, he's actually much slimmer, though, um, thinking about the physicality you mentioned. Um, but you don't have to play as Van. And in Final Fantasy X, you don't have to be Titus all of the time. If you're um, in a, a uh, part of the world where... Um, you have to explore a town and buy things at shops, then you're, you, you are that main character. Um, but when you're walking around the world and doing battles and things like this, uh, you can be any character. So I've actually been playing uh, Final Fantasy XII with a party of three women, and I've been running around as Ash, Fran and Pinello, and, and they're actually much stronger than Van now because uh, they, they've leveled up, you see, and he hasn't. So it really, and this goes back into the embodiment and the meaning making that each player brings to the game because other people will play it completely differently with maybe Van and two male characters in that party mm. or Van and two of his uh, female friends. You know, there are all kinds of different combinations. Um, and if you look at more recent games and, and things like Tales of games and um, the Persona games and what have you, the, the female characters are a lot stronger. Today I was just giving you some examples from the sure. kind of classic JRPG 
Metal Gear Solid has been criticized on that point though, that uh, Kojima Hideo's representation of women is um, questionable. <laughs> and I, I look at that more in the book actually. Um, but well, I liked what you said about the physicality of the people in video games. And I've done some work on this in representation of, of the human body. And very often, especially in fighting games, what you're thinking about is the ideal figure. You know, if you were a fighter, if you're going to play the fighting game, what would you want to look like? And what do you want to be able to do? And so the, the fighters have these huge muscles because they're made to punch and kick and, and do these things, a warrior physique, as you said. But again, as those games have gone on, and you can see it in Soul Calibur, there are more androgynous characters, there are uh, slimmer characters, um, not so heavily hyper-muscled, you know, and all different kinds of characters now. And it's, it's really interesting to see that development over time, actually. Mm, interesting. And then just another question quickly, because um, there's some chat building up there, I can see. Um, you said that, you know, if you look at the environments that they're operating in, you can see lots of sort of Japanese scenes or characteristics. So obviously you mentioned nature. You also see, you know, urban Tokyo streets, um, architecture, the importance of wood, for example. And something that just popped out at me that is something so important in Japanese culture and is food. Is there is there washoku represented? <laughs> Maybe it's dinner time here and I'm just hungry, but um, <laughs> does food come into play at all in, in oh. terms of Japanese food? Is that everywhere? Yeah. Or? Food, so I didn't talk about food, but food's <laughs> really important in Japanese video games and all the characters, you know, they always have to stop at an inn to eat something to refuel themselves. Uh, so that whole eating culture is very important. Um, but I showed you a still from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and there's a cooking uh, mini game, if you like, in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what happens is Link, ha Link has a certain number of hearts uh, that you see on the screen and if he takes damage in battle or his health goes uh, lower you can replenish his hearts by cooking food and eating it and there's this whole part of the game where you go around to different stables and you look at posters on the walls that show recipes of the the local delicacy and then you go around and get the ingredients and and put it in a cooking pot and it comes out and it's really funny because if you make a mistake and you put something awful in there, it comes out as this kind of green, brown, disgusting glop and it's called dubious food and Link will eat it and um, it'll give him one heart, but he makes this horrible face. Like he's obviously not enjoying eating what it is that you cooked for him. So it's really funny, but there's so many games and there's games just about cooking too. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right, I'm going to um, have a look at the chat because, as I said, it's building up. And, and you had just over 100 people today, so well done. You've really um, Thank you for tipped coming. the scales there. I knew it was going to be interesting. So the first question is, where can we purchase your book? That's a good question, isn't oh. it? <laughs> There's an interesting Yeah, uh, on the Routledge website. Yeah, routledge.com. Um, so it's um, it's not a there's no ebook or Kindle form yet. Yes, or? there's an ebook. It's hardback, uh, paperback, and there's an ebook version. You can get it for the Kindle. Okay. Um, yeah, the I think the Kindle was going for about forty dollars at one point. I don't know what it is now. They had a sale a couple of weeks ago, which might still be going. I'm not sure. Okay. But yeah, okay. routelist.com. Okay, we'll great. Thank you. Hopefully that'll be some sales for you. Or Amazon. Um, there's, <laughs> there's some questions here from Maria. There's quite a lot of linked questions here, I think. So um, do Japanese games reflect the process of changing national identity in Japan? So, for example, um, as, as do the newer games sort of change the Japanese rep representation of themselves or their identity? And then linked to that... Um, are there any Chinese or South Koreans in, in some of those games as well? And how are they depicted? Yeah. And nice. then the third, the third, she's got three questions here, really. Sorry. Does the Japanese government have any sort of program or strategy for gaming industry? Well, clearly it's in cool Japan, isn't it? And some of those things, are, other things are in cool Japan as well. But anyway, so those are three sort of linked questions there from Maria. Thank you for those. Um, the first idea was uh, the changing national identity. Um, I don't, surprisingly enough, now that you've asked me that, I actually find it really consistent that the same tropes are used, the same imagery is used. 
the same basic attitudes about life and death and religion and uh, things like this are, are quite similar. Um, what you do find in newer games is um, more diversity and representation, I'd say, um, compared to older games. I think that there's more uh, gender fluidity, for example, in games now. Um, but in terms of the overall idea of what it means to be a Japanese person and living in Japan, I don't really think that that has changed that much over time. Um, thinking about representation of Japanese people, Chinese people, Korean people and other people through Asia, um, there are a lot of different Asian characters in Japanese games and um, sometimes they're portrayed um, quite negatively. All right, usually it's a um, an essentialized kind of a stereotyped representation. And the main genre that you find these kind of characters in is the fighting game genre, which essentializes everybody anyway. So if you're looking at the typical French character, you know, they'll, they'll have all kinds of stereotypical ideas about what a French person is fighting with a rapier and, and being very fashionable, <laughs> things like this. Um, but when you look at the uh, Chinese and South Korean characters that in fighting, games are usually depicted in very specific ways and I've written about this and uh, processes of, of orientalism for example and it's tied up with ideas that go right back to the Meiji period and earlier about whether Japan is you know what is Japan's identity as part of Asia is it part of Asia or is it something different because it's an island kind of off the coast right uh, so Japan has been kind of struggling with this idea of, of what Toyo is, what is the Orient, what is the East, are we part of it, should we lead it, right, um, with the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere and, and all that kind of ideology. And so you see this informing uh, current representations of Chinese characters and South Korean characters in particular, and I've argued in my work that it's the South Korean characters who are the most uh, sexualized, for example, in, in fighting games uh, in different ways. They have the most flamboyant, colorful costumes and, and so on like this. Um, with the South Korean characters these days, uh, there's a really interesting um, depiction of Korean characters in the Yakuza games by Sega. And this, this has changed over time actually, right? And so the, the Sega games are quite nuanced in the way that they portray Koreans, right? You have people from South Korea who are in the K-pop industry and they're in Japan, you know, trying to get their K-pop stars, bigger venues to, to sing at and things like this. And then you've got Zainichi Korean people in the game, right, who are... Uh, an ethnic uh, minority in Japan who faced quite a lot of discrimination. And the game shows that, right? Because those Zainichi characters are kind of interacting with the Yakuza and what have you. And there's a really, really interesting dynamic there. So I, I think I, I took quite a long time on that answer, yeah, that's but that's fine. something that really interests me is this representation of the different ethnicities in Japanese games. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here from Nasra. Um, so curious to know about video game addiction and self-isolation in Japan and Japanese youth, I guess referring to the hikikomori. Um, is, there any, is there a correlation between video game addiction and self-isolation and an increase in mental health issues? And do video games try and ad address that in any way? Or do they fall into the trap of sort of rendering youth vulnerable to, to those kinds of health issues? So. Yeah, yeah that, that's an interesting question. Thank you for that. And there is certainly an, a kind of idea that we have of the gamer kind of shut away in their room on their PC, uh, playing games for hours and hours and hours. Um, and certainly, you know, of course, all around the world, uh, some teenagers and young people do become addicted to video games or any other activity that they do obsessively, right? Um, but what's interesting in Japanese games is that um, games like Persona, Persona 5, um, uh, Animal Crossing, they've started to build a lot of socialization into the game itself. 
And so in Persona, for example, a lot of the game has to do with you as the individual building up social relationships with other characters in the game. And you do things by very mundane activities like initiating a conversation or going for a coffee together or uh, calling them on the telephone to ask for advice about your homework. It's, it's based in school, <laughs> this game. Um, so it's very relatable to the young audience. And what happens is you, um, you increase your social power, right? And the more social power you have, uh, the better your uh, uh, persona or your avatar can uh, fight battles when you go over into the fighting plane of the game. Um, in Animal Crossing, it's interesting because they incorporate ideas like shyness into the game and the game recognises that you, mm. as a newcomer to the island, you might not want to go around and make friends and that the game recognises that's a big step to go up to someone and actually initiate conversation and the game character will, will show that hesitation. Uh, but if you do actually interact with other characters in the game, it gives you points for that. And then you get this kind of range of emotional responses uh, that so you can you can choose to wave at someone or frown at them or um, talk very loudly at them or something like this. And, and if you go up to someone and you talk very loudly at them for a long time, they'll walk away. So it's kind of teaching you how to act as a social being. Uh, which I think is really interesting. And so uh, the game companies recognize that um, perhaps uh, young people feel isolated. They feel that socialized, social isolation and don't know where to begin. You know, mm -hmm. how do you go and make friends? That's really interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, a comment here from Leo, great presentation. Um, and there's a very specific question. What do you think that Avalanche represents in Final Fantasy VII? Ooh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that means question. nothing to me. Hopefully that means something to you. <laughs> so Avalanche is the guerrilla organization that Cloud joins and it's led by Barrett Wallace and, and people like this. And they run around um, basically dismantling nuclear reactors. Okay, so I, I see it as a kind of anti-nuclear guerrilla movement, just as the game wants me to. And the reason why I read it as nuclear and not just anti macro is because there's so many ideas in the game. It's like an allegorical tale of nuclear critique. And so this thing called Mako, uh, you know, it mutates, material mutates over time. Uh, Mako affects your body, right? You uh, become radioactive with these glowing eyes and things like this. Um, so yeah, in a, in a nutshell, I would just call it the anti-nuclear movement, I'd say. It all sounds very James Bond to me, which is much more a genre I'm much more familiar with than uh, gaming. But anyway, uh, Fabio, who's one of our lovely SOAS colleagues, um, said, fascinating topic. Thank you. Um, looking at the representation of Japan, uh, the representations of Japan, I was wondering what role self orient self orientalize <laughs> I can't do it. self orientalization played. So is the assumption that these games will be played by Japanese players or are they meant to portray Japan in a particular way to a foreign audience or I, I guess to foreign gamers as well is what he's asking? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in the book, so I talk about Orkami a, a fair bit and this game is um, very deliberately made as a Japanese cultural product. It's very self-conscious about this. It crams as much Japanese culture as possible into the game. Uh, there's a, like a yokai encyclopedia where you can fight against various monsters and then look them up later and see, uh, you know, their artwork and what kind of monster they are and what elements they're weak to and things like this. Um, and so in a way, I think that Clover Studios is self-orientalizing Japan right packaging well actually the first part of my book is called packaging Japanese culture or something like that like we're packaging the idea of Japan to sell it right overseas but also to, to Japanese people right let's um sell it to young Japanese people so they can revel in Japanese culture and uh, attain this kind of celebratory idea of what Japan is all about um I, I definitely think there's a lot of that going on yes Thanks. Um, a question here from Ben. Uh, 
um, who starts off saying he's very excited that that gaming along with manga and anime is being used more frequently in discussions of Japanese culture. So thanking you for that. He said, what do you think about the narrowing of the lens um, in terms of looking in on Japanese culture when, uh, when overseas players are looking in? So he gives the example um, that, you know, there's a choice of which games are released overseas and which become more popular outside of Japan. So he's given an example of Dragon Quest VI uh, the most popular game in Japan, but was not released in English at all. Um, another one he gave was um, the manga Slam Dunk, didn't become popular overseas, even though it was more popular in Japan. Uh, yeah, so what, what about the ones that are, how, do, how does that narrow the lens maybe of, of looking in at Japan? Right, yeah, and you're perfectly right. You know, there's a lot of games that are made for just consumption within Japan. Right, a lot of PC games just stay in Japan. Um, some uh, some series become a lot more popular outside Japan, such as Final Fantasy. Right, it'll sell better. Um, the whole uh, kind of rivalry between Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy is an interesting one because they're made by the same company. <laughs> right, um, but I'm not sure what you mean by narrowing the lens quite so much here on Japanese culture, um, but, you know, it's, it's quite accepted in game studies that a lot of Japanese material doesn't make it out of Japan. And so what do you make of that? Do you go and study the things that are less accessible? in the West, right? Because that's one way I could have gone with the book. I could have uh, gone and hunted down the, the kinds of games that we don't really see here because they're not exported here, right? Um, but I decided not to go along that line because what I wanted to do was show my students, many of whom have grown up playing all these PlayStation games and, and, uh, and things on the Nintendo consoles, you know, well, what do we learn about Japanese culture from, from playing those games? Those big, huge blockbuster triple A studio games, which are smoothed out and kind of made um, attractive for the overseas audience, right? What, what is it that the designers are trying to include in those games? What version of Japan do they want to show us? And this comes back to the self orientalizing, right? So there are some people who are kind of digging up the, especially the PC games. There's so many uh, PC games that never had release in, in North America or around the world. And they're, they're looking at those in more detail and say, well, what's in here? And what can we tell about that? But I kind of took a different tack mm. with the book. Yeah, and I mean, you can argue that the, the gaming has widened the lens, hasn't it, of, of Japan? I mean, I'm sure you do in Delaware, but we get so many students coming to SOAS to study Japanese language or some other aspect of Japanese studies because they've grown up with Japanese manga and anime and, and gaming. And, and so that's often where their interest in Japan starts, isn't it? You, you hear that all yeah. the time. So in fact, it's kind of widening the lens into Japan in many ways, I would say. Yeah, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, and a lot of my students come in playing, they've all just played Persona 5. So oh. last year in my <laughs> game studies class, I teach a class called Video Games and Japanese Culture, and like half the class had played Persona 5, and I'm like, wow, this is a real kind of homogeneous set of students with this <laughs> playing experience behind them. Um, there's a question here. What is your opinion on the fetish site? I can't speak tonight. I've been teaching all day. Fetishization of the black body in Japanese animation and games. So would you say there are similarities between the way cross-cultural interaction occurs between African-American and Japanese pop culture in anime and video games? Right. That's a really interesting question. And that would probably be uh, more relevant now in the, the games that are being released uh, these days. In the, the games that I'm talking about, there are very, very few black characters. And um, especially, I did some work on this with the Street Fighter series. It's quite interesting. Um, back in the, you know, you're talking about the 16-bit <laughs> pixel days when um, the, the skin tone of characters was quite difficult to achieve. It was kind of all or nothing. So if you had an African-American fighter, for example, you'd have very dark skin tone, but then somebody like Ryu and Ken, 
would have the same skin tone, even though Liu is meant to be Japanese and, and Ken's meant to be white American. And so this um, very visual uh, difference, right, singling out the black character as opposed to all of the other characters who are supposed to be from Brazil and Japan and America and that they all look the same, uh, it's very, very notable. And then you get uh, characters like in Final Fantasy VII that I was talking about. Um, Barrett Wallace is the leader of Avalanche, the guerrilla movement um, against, the, against Shinra. And he looks like Mr. T, right, who was a big uh, pop culture figure on television in the 1980s. And so the way that the Japanese designers have drawn these um, Black and African American characters is very specifically drawn from famous black people that they knew, right? Mm. Such as, uh, you know, boxers or, you know, Mr. T on television, uh, things like that. Um, Soul Calibur didn't get a black character until quite late in the series. And then it was, oh, uh, what's his name? The Salomel. And he was, it's set in the 16th century. So <clears throat> he was a, a, a Moor, a, a Moorish, uh, uh, person who came through but he's on the cover of one of the games and it's a very forbidding character he's wearing a hooded cowl and he's carrying this scythe and he basically looks like the figure of death and so you could argue you know the way that these characters have been represented in fighting games hasn't been very positive over the years hmm. uh, there's an interesting question here about um uh blood so uh, this person was in a seminar with a journalist um, where it was told that Japanese gamers dislike blood despite many Japanese games involving fighting and killing. So could it be related to the Shinto, um, you know, blood being impure? Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so if you look at um, Japanese game design and censorship, I don't do a lot of work on uh, censorship in Japanese games, but it's interesting what's shown in Japan and what's shown overseas. And um, in Soul Calibur, I always talk about Soul Calibur because I've played all those games and I'm very familiar with it. Um, but when you hit somebody in Soul Calibur, instead of red blood coming out, light comes out. Right, so you get this um, emission of light out of the body and it's, it's almost like the body's energy dissipating into the atmosphere, I feel like. Um, but it makes it a very spectacular and not revolting <laughs> uh, scene to watch, right? So if you're thinking about fighting games in particular, these are things that are played in arcades with lots of people behind you. So like playing these games in the 1990s in the Japanese arcade, there'd just be a huge crowd around you and they're all screaming and jumping up and down or, or watching very carefully and and so it's a spectacle and the game designers and the executives and the arcade owners knew that you couldn't have this huge spectacle of blood just out in the street in Shinjuku right um, so the, the games are made in in very specific ways so as not to have that and uh, that has to do with the kinds of people that wander through arcades as well as you know at home on the console you're very often thinking about a younger audience with console games um, and, and so on but it's really interesting about the Shinto and mm -hmm. indeed if you know the, the game franchise uh, Grand Theft Auto it's, it's by Rockstar Games it's a western game series uh, but in the western version in the version that I have if you kill somebody in the game and they fall down, their body's on the street, and then you can kind of kick the body, <laughs> and money will come out because they, they drop all the money out of their pockets is the idea, and then you can collect the money and run off with it, right? Um, in Japan, if you kill somebody, in the Japanese version of the game, if you kill a character in that game, it's been localised so the body doesn't stay around on the street. So you can't desecrate that body by kicking it or running it over with a car or any of the other inventive ways you can get money out of a body in the American version yeah. because they don't want the dead body desecrated in the game. So there is something to what you say with the religious aspect. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, there's a question here which, which sprang into my mind as well. So um, the characters that you talk about, Cloud and Sora and Snake, visibly appear to be Caucasian. So you mentioned at the beginning blonde hair and blue eyes as well. So what does this say about the relationship between Japanese-ness and whiteness? 
Um, and how does that factor into your assertion that the JRPGs are modern shisho setsu when, when thinking about Japanese people? Yeah, thank you so much for that. So Koichi Iwabuchi has done a lot of work on this idea of the mukokseki Japanese product, like the culturally odorless Japanese product that can be shipped overseas and, and played anywhere. And so with those, uh, with Cloud Strife in particular, this is why I did a, an in-depth study of him as a shonen character in the book, because yes, he's blonde and he has blue eyes, but what does that mean? The blue eyes are intimately connected to the narrative of the game with this mutation of, of muckle, right? And then the blonde hair, I think the shape has more to do with things than anything else, this spiky hair, the dynamism, this idea of genkiness in the young Japanese uh, shonen youth, right? Um, but then when you get over to Snake as well, it's very interesting, the original um, cover art for Metal Gear Solid um, had a blonde haired, blue eyed protagonist on the cover, right? And they changed that later uh, in later uh, iterations of the game. And he didn't look like that anymore. It was a much more neutral kind of gray scale um, face with, with high cheekbones and what have you. And in the narrative of the game, um, Snake is revealed to have Japanese uh, genetic heritage. And uh, there's another character in one of the games who's a, a Native American ancestry. And he says, oh, you and I have a lot in common because our ancestry is, you know, from the islands and <laughs> all this kind of thing going back into the, that's a huge backstory, right? And you're correct, visually, they don't look Japanese, these people, right? So what I argue in the book is more that it, it's not the, the, um, the visuals of these characters so much as what, what they do, their attitudes, um, what masculinity means to them, what are the causes that they're fighting for, uh, things like this. But there's so much interesting stuff to be thought about in terms of, you know, because in the fighting game genre, Akira Yuki, Ryu, uh, Kazuya Mishima, they're all constructed in exactly the same way visually, right? And they're very, Typically Japanese looking to have black hair, dark eyes, etc. But JRPG is different and it works in a different kind of way. It's got its own rhetoric, if you like. So I'd like to think about that more. Hmm. There's a few questions here sort of basically asking the same thing. So um, you've talked about how Japan and Japanese culture is depicted in, in, in these games. But um, what do you think some of these games have to say about Japan looking out on the world and looking at other cultures and in that sense? So Japan looking out rather than people looking in on Japan. <laughs> so do you mean how these games represent other kinds of cultures other than Japan? Well, Japan's perspective on those cultures is what right. they're asking, essentially. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess um, some of them are asking the depiction of other cultures and some are thinking about the Japan's perspective of other cultures. There's a few right. questions there. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So taking America as an example, right? Um, if you look at Street Fighter, <laughs> I keep coming back to Street Fighter, um, but the way that Street Fighter 2 is set up with Ryu as the default player one and Ken as the default player two, it's very interesting. Um, because Ken is American, he's blonde, right? Um, he wears red, where Ryu wears white. So it's a very ancient Japanese red versus white kind of color palette going on there. Uh, but it's always Ryu versus Ken. And if you look at the, you know, museum exhibits of Street Fighter and things like this, it's always Ryu versus Ken. And so America is kind of set up as the ultimate opposition to Japan. It's this binary system where it's always Japan versus America. And the way that uh, American characters are introduced in the series is quite interesting. And you get this character, Guile, uh, who has blonde hair, it's kind of gelled straight up from his body. Um, he's a military man. He wears a, a you know military uniform, big uh, combat boots and things like this. And this idea of the American military man is very, very common in, in Japanese games of all, all um, genres okay and so uh, Metal Gear Solid kind of make, makes fun of it a little bit right so Snake is this um, 
military man and he's sent out into uh, you know, the Middle East and Costa Rica and all these different places all around the world uh, to take part in military activities. But then we find he's actually, you know, he has Japanese heritage. So what does that mean about the, the you know, stereotype of the military man that we have? And uh, different game designers have different ways of playing with this stereotype of America, right? And you can see that with other cultures, uh, with other cultures in, in the Japanese games as well. So I, I mentioned the Yakuza games that look in a more nuanced way at the Korean culture. Now it's, I find it fascinating and there's so many games available and they all represent characters from all around the world, right? So you could do so many studies of Japan's perspective on the West or Japan's perspective on African countries or Japan's perspective on Latin America, right? And these are all fascinating studies to me and I'd like to read them. If you do them, send them to me because I want to read them. <laughs> um. I'm conscious that it's 6.30, but there are tons of questions. So are you okay to go a little yeah, bit, we can, a little we can bit longer? Um, I'm probably not going to get to all of the questions. I'm sorry, because there are just so many here. But I knew that this was going to be a, a lively, very interesting. I'm going to pick another very specific gaming question for you. Um, do you see uh, Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII as a villain or a victim of a biological experiment? So the person saying, I think he's a really complex character like other villains, just wanted to ask your opinion. Yeah. I love that question. That's fantastic. And Sephiroth's so frightening in the game, right? You go through and he's this just incredible figure of power and his sword does so much more damage than yours ever can, right, when you're looking up to him. And then you, you're going through this wasteland, right, and there's this, all of a sudden there's this massive spike with a snake on it and the spike's going through this giant snake's neck and you just kind of stand there and say, did, did Sephiroth do this? And so, you know, the game builds up and builds up and builds up and then you meet Sephiroth and he's this horrific villain and you're terrified of him, but then you find out all his backstory and he's been completely twisted right and he has all these genetic experiments done on him and in the womb and everything like this and you, you do end up feeling sorry for Sephiroth so I do think he's a, a tragic figure he's also a horrific villain um, but this is this is my point about how um, the square game designers really manipulate the player in very intelligent ways and the impact the emotional impact of these things on the player just can't be um, described you know you go through it and and you're just gutted at some of the things that happen and and then you realize something else and you, oh oh no and the, for quite parts of the game you're really not sure am, am i the evil one am i am i the good one you're really not sure right and so the idea that sephiroth's this villain or maybe not, you know, that, that really fits into the whole idea of the game, playing with the uh, emotions of the player in this way. Mm. Uh, I got that... carried away there. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so a number of people have asked about Final Fantasy VII, Helen, and so, you know, this yeah. is one of the big canonical games everyone knows, you know. Well, actually, there's another question here about Final Fantasy VII. So the remake is only in its first part, so how do you feel or see the differences in it compared to the 97 version in terms of representation of characters, environment, and of course, modern Japan as well? So I'm going to confess here, I haven't played the new one. <laughs> yeah, well, so I played the old <laughs> one on a, I, I've played, so, so for the research for my book, I was very careful to play the original versions. Okay. Right. So, and this entailed buying old consoles. <laughs> and um, when I put Final Fantasy VI into the PlayStation, I had the disc, and it was originally released for the Nintendo, right? Um, so I cheated on that one. I got a PlayStation 2 version of it, and I put it into the PlayStation 2, and I couldn't save it because it was a, a, an earlier game, and I needed a PlayStation 1 memory card in order to play it. So I had to order the memory card on Amazon and then wait three days. This is before <laughs> Amazon Prime. And to wait three days and then, you know, my game was racking up hours. So it 
even when I was sleeping, it was racking up hours. So I was really upset that my <laughs> game time had like 72 hours added onto it, even before I really started the game even. But no, I, I haven't played the new one. Okay. So. Um, there's a question here. Can you comment on the Pokemon phenomenon? And why has this been so successful over the last few decades, particularly given the international success? Yeah, yeah. So there's pocket, uh, you know, I've got my Pokemon, You've got your Pokemon thing up there yeah. next to the cactus. <laughs> um, yeah, Pokemon's just an incredible phenomenon all around the world. And, and there's been a lot of books written about Pokemon and Pikachu. Uh, Pikachu's Global Adventure is a really good book if you want to read that one. Um, but, you know, it's, it's perfect. It's a collecting game right so you can obsessively hunt down all the different kinds of monsters and learn all about them and uh you know games like orkami have this as well katamari damasi there, there's always like a collection board where you can go in and make sure that you have every single item and learn all about them and it becomes a mark of you know cultural knowledge um what did pierre bourdieu always used to talk about I'm completely blanking now. Cultural capital. It's your cultural capital that you know all there is to know about every single different creature. That's something that people really take pride in. And especially for the younger players, right? If your world is completely confusing to you, which it is most of the time to all of us, um, being able to control your game and all the little characters in it and know everything there is to know about something uh, gives you a real sense of confidence and um, calmness I think in a confusing world so I mean that's why I think Pokemon does so well and they're just fun to play and they're, they're cute they're colorful right it's got a lot going for it and it translates very easily into other languages there's not huge amounts mm. of text or dialogue that you have to worry about so they localize very seamlessly all around the world. Uh, we've got a question here from Sebastian, who's a lecturer in modern Japanese studies and says, thanks for your book. Um, had a great experience reading it with students in the seminar. Um, and intrigued by the concept of gameplay as discursive practice that you mentioned um, at the end. So the question he um, has is, in light of very influential game studies paradigms like procedural rhetoric, where would, um, where would the player subject and their agency in reading the text fit into this model? And how would you relate game players' discursive practice to the programmed rhetoric of development teams and corporate execs? So there's two parts to that question. Mm. So you're thinking about procedural rhetoric. Yeah. From two directions. Other, One was the games, executives. Yeah. yeah. The executive decision level. And what was the other one? Um, in terms of game studies, uh, more influential game studies paradigms uh, themselves. Yeah. So if th I guess putting it into the literature that's out there is would be my reading of it. Yeah. So you're Sorry. thinking about Ian, Ian uh, Bogost and the procedural rhetoric there. And I like to also use uh, Ken McAllister. He works on a lot of uh, rhetoric in games and... Um, how the game right so what we're talking about is how the game rules position the player in terms of the player's agency um, their abilities to choose various things in the narrative and shape the game in certain ways and really produce their own narrative okay so what is discursive practice when we're meaning making we're story making um, and we're making our own interpretation out of this and reader response theory comes into this quite a bit too and there's some very interesting PhD theses being written now about you know games through the reader response theory lens um, but I like the idea of uh, the player as a subject or agent of their own story and their own discursive practice uh, and I come back to that word um, because what we're doing is by playing these games we're adding to the discourse right so this discourse surrounds us so taking bioethics as an example Right? There's all these laws being made about cloning. There's Kojima Hideo making games about you know, cloned people and what it feels like 
to be a cloned person. And then you feel that, right, uh, as a subject playing the game and also as a, a character who's positioned as a subject at the centre of the, the narrative. Um, there's a lot of different levels of identity going on, right? Um, but as you play through the game and you embody this character and you feel what they feel, um, I think that this enables you to create your own version of that discourse. And through your gameplay, you have the lived experience of being part of the broader discourse that surrounds you. So if you're looking at the news every day and it's about stem cell research and things like this, and then you're playing a game that's made the same year. So Metal Gear Solid 4 came out in 2004 and um, it's all about stem cells. And because that's when, um, the, the Japanese uh, scientists won the Nobel Prize for the, their stem cell research. It, it really reverberated through the whole society. Um, and, and so you're playing in this and it, it becomes part of your personal experience. Right? So this discourse isn't something that's just in the context anymore. It's, it's in the game text called Metal Gear Solid. And it's also in your game text called Rachel Hutchinson's experience of Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> right, as the subject and centre of that narrative. So I, I don't know if I've, uh, this is something I'm developing as well. I don't know if I'm expressing myself very clearly here, um, but that's how I think about it. And when you're talking about the, um, the game designers and then the level on top of that with the, the studio executives who make the final decisions on what is going to be distributed? How do we market this? What do we put on the cover of the game? What kind of artwork best represents and encapsulates the ideas and the ideology of this game? That's another level of, again, and then you're getting into ratings and censorship and, and all that kind of interesting stuff. Uh, so thank you for that hint, actually. I'll have to take that into consideration as I develop this idea of, you know, games as discourse, a games adding to the broad discourse of a time and, and what the player's role is in all this, not only experiencing that discourse for themselves, but adding to it uh, through mm -hmm. their own lived experience. Uh, there's a question here from... Andrew, who's one of our JRC visiting scholars, could you talk a little bit more about the localization of these games for different audience, audiences around the world? And also perhaps um, to the extent that it exists, their transnational production. So does this complicate the notion of these games as Japanese culture? I'll take the second question first. Uh, Mia Consalvo and uh, Jeremy Peltier-Gagnon have done a lot of work on this, right? So they look very specifically at things like the JRPG as a transnational product. And Mia Consalvo uh, has looked at uh, Square Enix in particular and the Final Fantasy series in particular as a corporate product. So rather than me trying to answer that, I mean, yes, the simple answer is yes, these are transnational products, right? Square Enix has uh, offices all around the world, right? Um, but I really do direct you uh, to, to those scholars' work. In terms of localization, um, there's some really, really interesting examples of how uh, Japanese games going out have been localized in, in various ways for specific markets and how uh, other games have been localised coming into Japan for the Japanese market. So I'll give you an example of each, right? When Soul Calibur was exported or taken out to uh, the Asian market, right? If you're looking at places like Korea, uh, that image of uh, Mitsurugi Heishiro with the katana, the samurai, sword, all, all the rest of it, that's very offensive to the Korean audience. Okay, who was under uh, Japanese oppression for many years as, as a colony of Japan, right? So what they did with um, Mitsurugi, they made a new character called Arthur, and he's meant to be this kind of swordsman. Uh, and Arthur has blonde hair and an eye patch. Uh, but this being the early days of localization back in the 90s, uh, that's basically all they changed about Mitsurugi. So they didn't really bother changing Arthur's 
sword. So it's this blonde guy with an eye patch with a katana and tubby socks. Right? So it's very incomplete kind of uh, localization, but it was enough to be able to sell the product overseas. Okay. Um, what, what's interesting coming into Japan, there's an American game Fallout, right? And I, I haven't thought about this game for a while, but you're going through the environment and there's an unexploded bomb, right? And it's an atomic weapon. I forget the name of the town that it's in. But as the player in Fallout, you have a choice to detonate this atomic bomb and just obliterate the town, okay? Now, in the Japanese version of that game, when the game was coming into Japan, it was localized so that the player does not actually have that choice. Oh, Megaton, thank you. Somebody <laughs> just said, yes, thank you so much. Yeah, the town of Megaton. And in the Japanese version of Fallout, you don't have that choice. So you could call it censorship or you could call it localization, but the atomic anxiety, nuclear fear is so strong in Japan, they did not want the player to be put into that agonizing position of having to decide whether to detonate an atomic weapon on civilians or not. So it's kind of, it's interesting to see the different kinds of um, ways that the games are localized going in and out of Japan. Um, I'm just gonna have one more question because I'm conscious of the time and then end with a comment because there's a couple of comments that are similar. Um, so there's a couple of people asking about war experience and war memory. Yeah. Um, so there's one in particular here from Alex who says, um, in more traditional media, films, books, and so on, the Japanese experience of the war has been reflected in more nationalistic ways. But in his um, personal experience of gaming, that, that sort of overt national, nationalism isn't so clearly represented in gaming. So what, 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 why might that be? Or do you think that you know, war experience or war memory is, is just portrayed differently in video games compared to traditional media. So asking about war memory and, and yeah, nationalist. That's memory. fantastic. There's a, Thank couple, you of there's a couple, of, couple of questions about war there. Whereas I've taken that one as an example. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is another hour long presentation. <laughs> <laughs> But it's chapter seven of my book. So I was very interested in this question about Japanese depictions of war. And if you, if you stick with the games I've been looking at today, Final Fantasy and Metal Gear Solid, for example, uh, they, they have quite negative depictions of war. It's not something that you really want to get into. It causes all kinds of human suffering, right? And, and so uh, the overall message tends to be anti-war and anti-nuclear. They go together, right? Um, and so there's a very nuanced uh, idea of war in these very long games because long games have the space to be nuanced and have a very kind of complex uh, idea about war, put you in that soldier's position, have you fight as the soldier, experience war for yourself and realise, no, it's not really something that we should be doing. Uh, but if you look at other genres, so real-time strategy, for example, or online card games, um, then you find a greater range of different kinds of depictions of war. Uh, some are positive, uh, some are negative. Um, some people, uh, uh, most of the Japanese gaming industry does not want to deal with uh, World War II because it's a defeat for Japan. Right. And so as a player, if you're playing a war game as a player, part of the fun is to experience winning. Mm -hmm. You want that victory at the end. And there's no victory narrative. You know, you can't make a Japanese call of duty. It'd be awful. Right. Mm -hmm. American uh, video game industry can make call of duty because America was on the winning side. Right. So we have all these kind of victory narratives that we can exploit for games. But Japan doesn't have that. Right. And so what do you do with that? Well, you can set the war in an alternate universe. You can make it a fantasy idea where it's not called the allies of the Axis powers. It's called something else, right? You can replay World War II through, through allegory. You can set it at sea. There's a lot of naval games, a lot. And uh, some of them depict the Battle of Midway. But, you know, depending on player action, it might be alternate history. Right. And a lot of the real time strategy games have alternate 
endings because it depends on the player's skill. And if you're a very poor strategy player like myself, you end up in an alternate history very quickly <laughs> um, because I lose the wrong battle and, and things like this. Uh, so it's kind of fun to see how those play out. But there are some games that are very nationalistic and you see some things like Kantai Collection is a, um, a online card game where you play as the Japanese Imperial Fleet and the cards, they're anthropomorphized as beautiful women, and, um, but they're based on actual Japanese warships from the Imperial fleet, and they have the same names, you know, and the, the battleship Yamato is in the game, right? And the, there's a whole manga and an anime about it, and in the anime particularly, it's really interesting because in the end, the Japanese fleet is victorious. And uh, what, what does this tell us about the way that uh, Japanese game designers are choosing to remember the war? It's, it's really interesting, actually. Mm. Well, it like you say, that's, genre. Yeah, yeah, and that's another whole big subject in itself. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to end with a couple of nice comments here, actually, and they're linked. So there's a comment here from Kira who also got very excited when you were presenting during the chat, putting lots of nice little comments in there. And she said that um, uh, when she was, I won't give the name of the university, um, but when she was studying, she did some research on video games and she was completely dismissed by her professor at the time as it had no academic value whatsoever. And since then, you know, she's never engaged with video games within that sort of academic environment for fear of being dismissed. So she was extremely grateful to have heard your talk and, and consider the value that there is now. And to follow that up, um, Mark Pendleton from Sheffield, oh. who I'm sure you uh, are one of our great Japanese studies colleagues, said, um, thanks for a great talk, Rachel. Nice to see your face as well. And he said, we've got several students at Sheffield now working on video games for their dissertation projects this year. And we're very excited to hear that you were speaking tonight because they've read the book and, and he knows that a lot a few of them were in the call tonight. So uh, just right. confirmation, just confirmation to Kira as well that, you know, this is a field that's really uh, growing thanks to your book as well. So I think that's a nice way to to finish off tonight. And um, I'm really sorry to those of you whose questions we couldn't get to uh, just because of time, but uh, there was over a hundred people in, in, the, in this seminar in the end and um, a lot of questions. So I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. I was just trying to get some different questions there. Hopefully you enjoyed it anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, Rachel, thank you so much. Um, I think I may not take up video gaming, but I, I think I'm interested in... <laughs> I think I'm interested in reading your book, though. So, oh, great. Yeah. So that, well, thank you so much for having you. me. And, and thank you so much to all the people that came and the wonderful questions. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, most of what I said is, is, is in the book. And uh, if you have specific questions about further reading, I can certainly send you, uh, you know, Mia Consalvo and Jeremy Peltier-Gagnon, Gonzalo Frasca and all those fabulous scholars uh, whose work went into uh, what, what I was presenting today as well. So uh, thanks again. I, I really enjoyed today. Thank you. And, and my final note of thanks is to Charles, who's been running this logistically and... Um, he may also be able to send you the chat and questions as well afterwards, so you can you can have a look at them. But people were so complimentary in the, in the chat as well, saying what a wonderful presentation it's been. So thank you. And I know you said you had the first snow in Delaware today, so keep safe and warm over the winter. And thank you. Uh, and I have to I have to apologise because I, I of course you are Australian. You're from the land down under, like myself. <laughs> And I was just thinking you'd gone, you know, you'd lived and studied in England. And um, for a moment there, I completely forgot that you yeah. were a fellow Antipodean like myself. So always nice to hear an Australian accent. No worries. So thank you so much, Rachel. Um, we're going to leave it here tonight. But thank you to everybody who joined us and hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thanks, everyone. Bye.